All right, all right. Gee, give me some water, would you? Give me some water in that thing, would you? Buddy? All right, all right. So we're here now at the end of uh, 10 truths that we've learned from King David, Israel's greatest king, about being great. And of course, I always feel responsible to say, because this world is so, well, you know the way it is. Uh, when I talk about great, I'm not talking about great as far as the world's definition of being great. Having lots of money, having plenty of power, um, lots of influence, and um, you know, uh, uh, those uh, carnal, or earthly, worldly kinds of goods and gifts and things and personalities and so forth. When God talks about being great, he talks about people who accomplish what he has created them to accomplish. Lots of times we call that the will of God. And I know that the will of God seems to be so broad, but let me just say to you that you have been created for a purpose, that God, you just aren't an accident that happened to plop onto this earth. That God had something in mind when you were in your mother's womb, like Jeremiah the prophet said. Jeremiah said, before I was even placed in my mother's womb. You called me to be a prophet to the nations. And you ordained me and anointed me to carry your good tidings into this earth. And, and, and so, like Jeremiah the prophet, or anybody else, God has a place in our life. The book of Psalms says that when you formed my inward parts in the womb of my mother, you put me together. You placed me together. You created me to be what you were going to use me for in this world. And so God has a purpose for our lives. And he has a, and he has a ministry for our lives. And we live in a world that constantly wants to diminish that and remove that and hinder us from being what God wants us to be and to accomplish what God wants us to accomplish in this world. We have great influence. I know that many of you may think you don't have a lot of influence, but I'll guarantee you that you do have influence over some people. You have influence over your children or your grandchildren or your family or the people you work with or your neighbors or people you go to school with. I mean, there, there are people that look to you and you may never know that they're, that they're looking at your life for some kind of an example or an encouragement, but I'll guarantee you, you have some influence. And what God calls us to do is to speak for him, carry his words and his ways throughout the society that we live in. And that's a pretty big job. And so God has created us to be able to do that, and our enemy wants to discourage that. In order to be great, to accomplish this purpose, what truth would have to be true in your life? Well, the first one was that great people become great on the battlefield. Yeah, not at home watching TV. You actually become great when you're, when you're actually doing it, when you're out there doing it. And because no one is perfect, the second truth is great people take responsibility for their own failures or their own weaknesses or their own losses. And, and not only do they take responsibility for them, they actually grow from those things. And then the third truth was that all of us have pain in our lives, and so great people rise above the pain of their past. And in order to rise above the pain of your past, sometimes, you know, you have to get in there and dig in it, and sometimes you have to talk with people about it, and sometimes you have to be strengthened with others. I mean, there are strategies and ways to move past the pain. Many of the addictions, many of the frailties, many of the weaknesses that we face are there because of, of pain that has not been dealt with from our pa emotional pain, psychological pain, or physical pain, or a combination of all of those pains. But great people rise above the pain of their path. The fourth truth was great people pay the price to be a worshiper of God. Great people worship the Lord. And to be a worshiper, it's going to cost you something. 
You're not going to be one of the one of the statements that David made uh, that is great is a great statement, and, it, and it's where we get that statement. I'm not going to I'm not going to offer God something that doesn't cost me anything. Uh, that was made about the threshing flow of Ornan. You remember a few weeks ago we came to the last verse that I read, and it said that that. Uh, and they, st- and they stood at the threshing floor of Ornan. And I said, there's a story behind that, and there's, there's more to that. Well, ju- just a flash of it. Uh, Ornan, of course, was a, was a member of the society there, and David wanted to worship the Lord. He wanted to, he wanted to make a sacrifice to the Lord, and he needed a place to make a sacrifice to the Lord. And so Ornan had a threshing floor, which was just a big open spot, and it was a good place for a, the type of burnt offering David wanted to offer to the Lord. And he, and he came to Ornan, and he said, Ornan, how much do you want for your threshing floor? And he said, well, David, you're the king. All of this nation belongs to you. You are God's man. So I'll just give you, take it, it's yours. And David looked at him and said, no, no, I want to know how much you want for it because I'm going to pay you for it because I'm not going to sacrifice to God on something that doesn't cost me anything. Now, that's a great, that, that, that's a great value, isn't it? That, that's an ethical value in our lives. Yeah. So to be a worshiper, it's going to cost you something and great people pay the price to be a worshiper. And then the fifth truth was great people think in a positive God-focused manner regardless of the circumstances. In other words, great people look at things through God's eyes, not man's eyes. And there is a world of difference in that. (laughs) The only difference between David and the other Israeli soldiers that day when Goliath came out and made his boast, which he did for 40 days, by the way, that, that gives you a lot of opportunity, I would say. And he, and he did it day after day. And the only difference between David and them was the way David looked at things. He was still a giant. He was still a champion. He was still bad. He's still armor covered. He had a big spear. I mean, he had all, nothing changed except one thing. When David looked at him, David didn't say, man, what a giant monster. Where did they get him? I tell you, you couldn't even get close enough to fight him. Woo, I'm glad I'm not in the army. When David looked at him, David only thought one thing was worth consideration in his physical life, and that was he was uncircumcised. Mm -hmm. Because circumcision is a a term of the covenant, and the Israelis uh, practiced circumcision because it said we are in the covenant with God. And because he wasn't, that meant he did not have the protection of God and he did not have the provisions of God. And so David said, why are you afraid of this guy because you are covered by God and he's not? Who is this guy that he thinks he can rail against the armies of God? Now, the only difference was the way David looked at things in a positive, God-centered light. Great people look at things through a positive, God-focused manner regardless of what the circumstances. The sixth truth was great people submit to God's authority authority and to the uh, and to the authority he delegates yeah, yeah. now this is a tremendous thing and I'm not going to preach every one of these uh, you, you you've been here in them but I mean it, every one of these are vital now guys I mean these are not just little tiny things that are listed as a checklist of something these are I mean submitted to God's authority and to those that God places in authority. It's an act of, act of submission. Number, the number seven truth is great people admit weaknesses and become accountable to others. That's the only way we're going to grow out of these things. All of us have weaknesses in life, right? I mean, all of us face weaknesses. We all have temptations. We all have issues. For some, your temptation doesn't bother me a bit. And mine doesn't bother you a bit. So what I'm saying here is that in the area of our weaknesses, don't hide them. Expose those weaknesses. It takes the sting out of them. And then attach to somebody in your life that is strong in the area in which you're weak. That's the way you handle those weaknesses in your life. And then number eight last week was humbly depend upon God and give him the praise and the glory he deserves. Uh, pride is a horrible sin. It is a, I know a lot of times we don't think of it that way and we, and we just kind of casually, you know, uh, just move over it as if, oh, it's not really a big deal. 
but it is, a, it is, according to God, it's a terrible sin, and it's a sin that he will not put up with, and he will fight against. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. You know? It is a terrible thing. These, uh, Psalm says, these six things the Lord hates, yea, seven are an abomination to him, and the first one on the list is a proud look. So it's a vital thing. I mean, pride just robs your life of everything. It, it hinders you. It holds you back. It's no telling how many things we won't do for the Lord because of our pride. We're afraid somebody's going to look at us and think we're some kind of fanatic or laugh at us or put us down in some way or, or say something that undermines us. I mean, the, and it's just pride is all it is. We won't lift our hands and worship. Why? We're too proud. We're afraid somebody, it'll make us look silly. You won't dance before the Lord, not only because you can't dance, but because, <laughs> you know, hey, look, if I do it, everybody ought to be able to do it because I sure can't dance. I am rhythmically challenged. You know that. But, but what would hinder us from, it, pride, pride. I mean, look at the things in life that hinder us and just go to the root of it and say, the root of it is just pride is all it is. I won't do it. Some people won't bow their knee and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Why? Pride. It's all it is. So great people humble themselves and depend on the Lord and they give him the praise he deserves. Now, if pride, I, I talked to you last week about pride, and I said pride was like a whisper. You know, the devil whispers to you. You, you, you don't have to take that. You're bigger than that. They don't know you. Why don't you do something? And, and just whispers to you. So if pride is a whisper, if pride comes as a whisper, this next tool of the devil comes as a shout. And that tool is the tool of discouragement. Discouragement, great people, number eight, great, number nine, great people overcome discouragement and achieve their destiny. If you are going to achieve your destiny, and by your destiny, I'm not talking about like some denominations talk about destiny. Some denominations, when they use the word destiny, they mean that God has already predetermined what's gonna happen and, and, and it's gonna happen regardless of whether you do it or what you think or whatever. And they call that your destiny. When I speak of destiny, I'm talking about that point at which God created you for. Your destiny involves lots of decisions and lots of times and effort, but, but God has a place out here, a will, a purpose. God has something for you to accomplish, and when you accomplish it, you have accomplished your destiny. God, God put that before you when he created you, and that's where you're moving toward. And So in order to do that, now I'm gonna guarantee you that if you are going to achieve your destiny, you are going to have to overcome discouragement in life because life, it is one of the favorite weapons of the enemy. It is, the, it is one of the most used weapons of the enemy. And one of the reasons why is because that weapon of discouragement is so easy to deploy. The devil can use discouragement in any area of our life. Think about it. In your money, in your family, in your relationships, in your job, uh, in your, in your uh, automobile, in your uh, friends, in your, I mean, anything can become a discouragement from you, for you if the enemy jumps into that thing. And it's so, we have to face it so often and it's so devastating that God says, all right, if you're gonna be great, you're gonna have to overcome discouragement and I'm gonna show you how to do it. And, I, and in David's life, there was a, there's a tremendous event that happens early in David's life before he even becomes king where David shows us exactly how to handle discouragement in life. It's just a, it's an amazing story. I don't even know if you've ever even heard of this story in David's life, but it's a, an amazing story of, of David and the discouragement that had to come into David's life as he moved toward the Lord. Number 10, just to speak this to you, number 10 is a, an accumulation of all the nine. Uh, and it says great people use their God-given free will to serve the Lord. Those nine things that I just named as truths, 
all of those things you choose to do. God has given you a free will. God did not create you as a robot. God did not create someone who had no choices in life. You all have a choice. And all of these nine things that have come before are all choices that you make. So a great person is a person who uses those choices to serve the Lord. I use my God-given free will to make choices to serve the Lord. God is not going to force you to do anything. You are going to have to choose to do so. And so that's the, that's the 10 there. But let's, to, in, in order to, to deal with this thing of discouragement, I told you this was a great, a great story that, that the Lord shares with us in the Bible. We're gonna to need to take a couple of steps back into David's life. And you might remember that David, king, David was anointed to be king of Israel when he was about 10 years old. Some people say eight, anywhere between eight and 10, 11, 12, right in there, uh, as a boy, as a boy. And you remember what happened. You remember that, that uh, Saul, who was the king of Israel, had become so arrogant and had become so uh, disobedient to God that it repented God that he had even placed Saul in, in, to be the king of Israel. And so God told uh, Samuel, the prophet, to go down to Jesse's house and that one of Jesse's sons was going to be uh, the king, so anoint him to be king. And he goes down there and Jesse has eight boys. And you remember, you remember the story, the, Jesse has his seven boys in the house and, and uh, Samuel prays over each one and says, God, is this man? Is this the man? Is this the man? No, 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 all seven of them. And then Samuel looks at Jesse and says, are these all your boys? Do you, ha do you have any more? He said, well, I, got, I, I have one, but he's a little toe-headed boy. I, I mean, it, it can't be, I mean, he, he's so singularly unimpressive that Jesse doesn't even think he could possibly be the one. He said, yeah, but he's out there keeping the sheep and all that. And then Samuel said, well, go get him. And, um, and, and so they go out there and everybody stands. And they come back in and Samuel prays over him. And you know the story, David is it. David is God's choice. God chooses David first. He is God's first choice. Now imagine the excitement now. I mean, you're, I, I don't know what David thought, you know, I, but, I, but I mean, I'm thinking if God came and anointed me to be king over America, uh, I would probably have some expectations about that, wouldn't you? I mean, I don't, I don't know, I, I don't know what really would happen, but I would think, well, you know, uh, maybe tonight or maybe in the morning, they're going to be this big black limousine pulls up in front of my house out there, and it's going to be filled with people, and they're going to, with great pomp and circumstance, come bring me out to the limousine and whisk, whisk me away up there to Washington, where there's going to be a coronation service, and then all of the people up there are going to be cheering and yelling and waving and, and happy and glad because God's first choice has now become the king and everything's going to be wonderful and exciting and I'm going to just go right into the palace. Yeah. Now, I don't know if that's what David thought was going to happen, but if it was, then he got sadly disappointed because that's not what happened at all. Now, you'll have to remember as I go through this story I'm talking about the one who has already been anointed to be the king of Israel. God has already said, you're my choice, you're my king. And as he goes through, it, it just one thing after another, he, at 12 years old, he becomes a, a worker in the palace of Saul. Saul has some kind of mental issue going on. He has some kind of psychological deal going on. Or maybe it's a physical deal. It, the Bible just says that an evil spirit came upon Saul, like a spirit of depression or maybe a manic kind of a spirit or, or maybe anxiety or just regular de depression. But anyway, it was very noticeable to everybody and it was a bad scene. And so they said, uh, we need to get somebody in here who can play soothing music. And, and that, when he starts having this fit, then he can start playing this soothing music and he'll, be, and he'll be eased. And does anybody know anybody like that? And then somebody in, in the camp said, you know, um, uh, yeah, I, I, was, I was down at the store the other day and there was this little boy in there. He was about 10 years old and he had a little uh, pipe, a little lyre with him and he had a little harp around his neck and he was standing there by the drink machine and he was just playing on that thing and he was just playing his harp and boy, he could play so beautiful, man. And the little fellow was good looking. 
I mean, he seemed to be able to talk to everybody in the store, had a good personality. And, 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 and it, well, who is that? Well, I think he's one of Jesse's boys. I, David, is that his name, David? Well, go down there. And, and they went down there and they got David and they brought him back to the palace as a 12-year-old boy, and he begins to serve the king of Israel, playing when Saul has these terrible bouts of this evil spirit. Well, when he's 15 years old. Now, he's already been anointed to be king. He's playing and soothing the one that he's going to replace, and he knows that. Saul doesn't know that. The service was kept silent. Samuel didn't tell anybody. There was no big fanfare. There was no Facebook, Twitter, Twitter, and all of that mess. There were no news cameras saying, David anointed king of Israel. Saul, it was a private ceremony that nobody was there except the family of David and Samuel. So here's David serving Saul who does not know that the one who is going to replace him is there already in the palace soothing his evil spirit. But David knows, and David's the king. So here he is playing, and when he's 15 years old, his dad says, son, I want you to go up to the battlefield because um, I, David's three older brothers were up at the battlefield. They were part of the army of Israel. But Israel was facing the Philistines, their dreaded enemy, their enemy of life, the Philistines. And David said, and, David, and Jesse says, go up there and take this uh, uh, cheese and crackers, uh, these nabs, take these nabs up there and, and go and... Um, Give them to your brothers and then find out how the war's going, you know. I mean, how's this battle doing and are they doing all right and so forth. Dave, David jumps up, yeah, boy. He comes, he goes up there, he gets the nabs, he takes them to the quartermaster and says, hey, these belong to my brothers and blah, blah, blah. And then just about that time, here comes this commotion out front. And it's that, it's that nine foot, nine inch giant of the Philistines named Goliath that walks out there and begins his daily diatribe of lamb blasting God, cursing God, and disrespecting Israel. And David looks and says, <laughs> who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he thinks he can defile the armies of God? And through a long story that I know you all know, finally David begins to run down the hill toward Goliath. And Goliath's down there saying, come on down here, boy. I'm going to feed you to the buzzards. You know, I'm going to crunch you and catch you, and I'm going to get you. And he's just threatening and threatening and threatening, and David's running down that little path down that mountain, going down there to him saying, you come to me with swords and shields, and I come to you in the name of the Lord. And battles are not won with few or many, but the battle is the Lord's, and he's going to put you in my hand, and I'm going to cut your head off today. And, of course, that's exactly what happened. And then David gets invited back to the palace to continue serving Saul. Now remember, we're talking about the boy that has been anointed to be the king of Israel. And he goes back to serve Saul, and as he's serving Saul, like he had done before, doing his job, playing his music, soothing his master, uh, uh, some women began to sing songs around town. And the songs have words like, Saul has slain his thousands and David has slain his tens of thousands. I don't know what the tune is, but that was the gist of it. The gist of it was that David now had stolen the hearts of the people of Israel. And they, were, they, they loved David and they were singing about David. And that old green-eyed monster of jealousy begins to rise up in Saul and Saul gets jealous about this. And, and, and he begins to, to try to kill David in the palace while David's playing and soothing him and comforting him. Saul's throwing javelins at him. And David is playing along, whoop, ducks the javelin, javelin keeps on playing. This is the king, this is the one who has been anointed to be king of Israel. He's a king in waiting and he's ducking javelins that the has-been king is throwing at him, and he keeps on playing. And then Saul decides that he's going to kill David, and so David has to run from Saul. So for the next four years, David is an outlaw. David is running for his life. Saul is pursuing him to kill him. 
Every time David turns around, Saul or Saul's men are upon him and, and, they're, and they're there with serious business. They're not there just playing. They're, they're there to kill David. Two different times David could have killed Saul, but he refused to do so. Because David considered Saul God's anointed and until God removed him, David said, I'm not going to touch God's anointed. In a cave, Saul comes in and David is in the cave. Saul doesn't know it and he cuts off the tip of Saul's robe and, and Saul doesn't even know it and then Saul goes back out and David from a distance yells, Saul, why are you trying to kill me? I'm not trying to kill you. What's going on here? Who told you something like that? You're my king. I love you. I, I serve you. God serves you. God, God has anointed you. You're the man. I'm not trying to kill you. And Saul says, I, I know it, David. I'm sorry, man. I, I don't know what's gotten into me. I'm so sorry. And, and he said, and David said, look, here's a piece of your robe. If I'm close enough to cut this, I'm close enough to kill you. Here it is. I didn't do it. I'm sorry, David. And he repents and everything. Next thing you know, he's right after him again. And then he, and, and, and one night, David and, 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 and Abishai, one of his great mighty men, walked down into the camp of Saul and Abner, who was his general, and all the other men of Israel. They were sound asleep. And Saul had a spear stuck by his head and a water jug. And they came down and they walked among the men and nobody woke up. And they got the spear and they got the water jug and walked out of the camp. And then, and then in the morning when all of them kind of woke up and started moving around, David yelled from across the creek over there and said, Hey, Saul! And he's holding up the spear and the water jug. And he's saying, I could have killed you last night, but I didn't do it. What's the deal? I thought we had a deal that you weren't going to chase me and, and, and try to kill me anymore. And Saul said, Oh, yeah. Man, I'm so sorry. I don't know what's going on with me. And I... Um, you're, my, you're my son, and I love you, David. And I... But he still tries to kill him again. And so David runs to a place that is most unlikely. Remember, this is the king of Israel. This is the boy that's been anointed to be the king of Israel, that has a promise from God that he's going to be king of Israel, <laughs> running for his life. He finally runs to the Philistines. The Philistines are the hated enemy of Israel. Remember, Goliath was a Philistine. And the Philistines were constantly in war with Israel. David goes to the Philistines and through a little deceit, <laughs> a little deceit, he convinces them that he is on their side now against Israel. He pretended, one of the things he did, he pretended to be uh, insane. He, he started foaming at the mouth and started scratching a post and trying to, you know, and they said, oh, he's mad. You know, Surely he has swapped sides. He's mad. He's crazy. I'm sure he learned that from Saul, watching Saul have fits. But anyway, the Philistines said, okay, okay, we'll trust you. Now, he went to the Philistines so Saul couldn't chase him anymore. That's, that was the only place he could go to that Saul wouldn't come after him. So he stayed with the Philistines a year and four months. And he served on some hunting parties with them and some raiding parties and so forth. And, and uh, they trusted him and, and, you know, and he had 600 of his men with him and they, they trusted him. And until one day, they, had to get, they were going and they were preparing for a battle with Israel up at Jezreel. As a matter of fact, it's the same battle that, well, never mind. Uh, they're preparing for a battle. And... The princes of the Philistines are examining the troops and they're looking at all the troops and they're looking and they're in lines and they're looking at their sources and troops and, uh, and they're evaluating uh, their army and all that. And then finally they come kind of to the back of the army and there's David back there with his 600 men and the prince, they just call him the prince of the, the Philistine army, looks at him and says, what's he doing here? And 
the king that let him be there said, well, you know, he's been serving me for about 14, 15 months now, and uh, he's done good. I mean, everything I've asked him, he's done. He hadn't done anything he shouldn't do. I, I think we can trust him. I mean, we, he's, he seems to be a good man. He hadn't done anything wrong and all that kind of stuff. And the, <laughs> and the Philistine prince said, don't you know that that's that guy that down in Israel they're singing Saul has killed his thousands and David, him, has killed his tens of thousands? Get him out of here. And so they run him away from the camp of the Philistines. And, they, and with the Philistines eliminating him and Saul still chasing him, David has but one place to go. And that's back to the city that the Philistines gave to him when, they, when he first came to them. It was a city called Ziklag. And the city of Ziklag was right on the border of Judah, southern Judah. And they said, here, David, you just have this and you and your men just have, this, is, this will be your city. And in that city, David and his men built homes. Their wives and their children were there. All of their possessions were there. And it was their city. And so when the Philistines run him back from the battlefield and Saul chasing him on the other end, he and his men go back to the little city of Ziklag. And as they approach the city of Ziklag, remember, David has been anointed to be king of Israel. This has been about 15 years we've been running around now chasing all of these things. 15 years is a long time, isn't it? 15 years, not 15 days, not 15 minutes, not 15 months. 15 years David has been anointed to be king of Israel. And from the time that he was anointed by Samuel, he has had nothing but one disaster after another disaster after another disaster. Two highlights in his life was the day he got anointed by Samuel to be king and the day he killed Goliath. Everything else is one problem after another problem after another problem after another problem. One fight after another fight after another fight after another fight. And now 15 years later, the Philistines have kicked him out and Saul's trying to take his life. And David and his men make their way back to the city of Ziklag where their wives and their children and their homes and their possessions are. And as David and his men rise over the hill to see Ziklag, when they look down at their city, they find that their base camp, the city of Ziklag, has been attacked by the Amalekites. While they were gone, the Amalekites came in and raided their town. And the Amalekites took all of their wives and all of their children. And they didn't kill any of them, but they took them as slaves, as prisoners. And they burned all of their houses to the ground. And as those 600 battled hardened warriors look down on the city of Ziklag to see their home, the Bible says that these men wept and wept and wept and wept. And they wept until there were no more tears for them to weep. Now, we all think of women as criers, you know. And we might expect that from, from our women. But these are battle-hardened soldiers. And when they look, they see the devastation. All that they've gone through for 15 years, every, every step along the way, I thought David was anointed by God. Where's God? They, David's going to be king of Israel, right? Because God anointed him, right? Where's God? And, they, and after 15 years, they look at their home and they, 
see the smoldering ruins of what used to be their houses and their wives and their children and their livestock and all of their possessions have been taken by the Amalekites. And, they're, and there they stand, men without a country, with the Philistines hating them on one side and the Saul chasing them on the other side. And, 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 and all seems lost. Devastating. Do, do you sense the devastation of that? You look over and you finally are home and your heart raises up and then you look down and boom, it's all burnt to the ground and your wife's gone, your kids are gone. Everybody's stolen. Just overwhelming devastation in life and discouragement. Now David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him because of the soul of all the people was grieved every man for his sons and his daughters as if the day had not gone badly enough. When the men stopped crying, they started talking. And you know what they were talking about? Killing David, stoning David. Everything God had promised him for 15 years now looks like some kind of sick joke. God, I hope you think this is funny because I don't think this is funny. I've been, I've been following you. I've been surrendered to you. I've been serving you for 15 months. I've been honorable in every way. I've not attacked my authority. I've done everything I possibly could do. God, is this some kind of sick joke that you're playing on me? One thing after another, after another, after... I, I'm sure Satan was yelling in, in David's ear, what a loser you are. You have to be the worst leader that has ever led in the history of the world. You can't even protect your men and your family and your children and you're going to be king of something? Huh. It looks like God turned his back on this, what he said to you. It looks like he changed his mind and it's a good thing too because you can't lead a Cracker Jack parade. <laughs> now at that point, many of us would have given up at that point, we would have been so discouraged and so annihilated in our, in our life that, that we would have given up. We would, would have lost all confidence in ourselves and all confidence in God. But David did not give up and David did not quit. My only question is, how did he keep from it? How in the world did David keep from giving up, becoming discouraged, and just walking away, throwing his hands up and saying, oh, I must have missed God. <laughs> I need to have a little talk with Samuel, I'm telling you that. The scripture says, next line, but David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. city's gone, the kids are gone, the wife's gone, the possessions are gone, the country's gone, Saul's after me, it's been 15 years. One battle after another, one discouragement after another. Now they're talking about stoning me and I don't blame them because man, this is a horrible thing. Their hearts are so bitter and their hearts are so broken because of their kids. They're, they're beside themselves and they gotta blame somebody and bless God, I guess it's gonna have to be me. But, but he encouraged himself in the Lord. Every great person, in order to accomplish and achieve your destiny, you are going to have to overcome discouragement in your life. And the closer you get to your goal, the more discouragement you are going to have to face in life. David stopped right in the middle of everything that was going on 
the, 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 the physical weariness of the moment, the emotional pain of personal loss, the rejection of men who had once trusted him, talking about stoning him to death. And without knowing what God was going to do to work things out, David chose to encourage himself and the one who had always been faithful to him. I wonder what he did. What did David do to encourage himself? Well, you remember David was a psalmist, right? You know what a psalmist is? It's a songwriter. A psalm is a song. And David was a songwriter. So I think that David encouraged himself by remembering the victories that God had given him in his past. I don't know about you, but I believe God has a call on my life. I believe God's called me to be here, even at this moment, at this time. And for however many years or whatever, I, God has a call and I've been pursuing God's call. I'm 64 years old. I've been in the ministry, what, 48 years or something like that, 50 years? Since I was uh, 18, I didn't count them up. But anyway, I used to be able to do that on the fly, but my old brain won't do that anymore. I can't multitask like that. But anyway, so as, God, God has a purpose. Now, I don't know about you, but if you are pursuing what you sense that God has called you to, being a great mom, having a great family, running a business, working somewhere, uh, developing your skills, being a great dad, leading a, uh, leading a Boy Scout troop, what, what, whatever it might be. If you, are, if you are still pursuing that, I'm guaranteeing you that you've been through some discouragement. And you've been through some times where you said to yourself, I, I, don't, I must have missed God. Because this is just terrible. People, people uh, 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 deceiving you, people distrusting you, people angry at you, people questioning your motives, people, all of these kind of things. Uh, deals didn't work out, property went away, lost money, don't have job. I mean, in the middle of all of that discouragement, yeah. how do you keep going? Yeah. You keep going because all along the way, God has done some things that couldn't have been done except by him, right? Yeah. And then if you get discouraged, what I do is I think back on everything that has happened in my life that there's no other explanation except God did it. And if God did it, God was making a way for me to do what he's called me to do. And no matter how discouraged I get or how the enemy tries to bomb my life, I know God worked in me this day right here. Nobody could have done it but God. And if God did it, that means God is moving me on my way and I can trust God and I don't know what he's doing, I don't know how he's doing, but he's always been faithful to me. And I can go on. When others look at me and say, you're wasting your time. Come on up here. You can be big and famous and blah, 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 blah. Or whatever he might say to anybody. No, no, no. No, what is, what, what, what is, what is God? And David strengthened himself in his Lord. I picture in my mind, David got his harp. Maybe the little lyre that he had, the little flute deal. Got, walked over there behind some of those trees got over there all by himself and, and, and he began to sing. You know, he just started, like, like Justin and, and, the, and the musicians did this morning, they just began to play, twinkle, twinkle, play, just a little melody, nothing, they don't even know what they're playing, they're just playing something that sounds beautiful in their ears and David begins to do that, he begins to play and all that sorrow that he's in and all that discouragement he's in and the devil jumping on his back and he's just beginning to play the little, little thing. And maybe, and maybe then uh, 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 he took some words from Psalm 59. Okay. Psalm 59, he had written a few years before this when Saul's hit squad had surrounded his house and was surely going to kill him. And had not Michael, Saul's daughter, his wife, looked out the window and saw the death squad 
and said, you better get out, David, and let him down out the back of the house on a, on a rope. David wouldn't have been alive to make it to this time. And you know what he wrote he, that time? He said, I will wait for you, O Lord, for you are my strength. My God of mercy shall come to me. Holy smokes. Do you know that that is the key to life right there with God? Yeah. And to not be discouraged. Do you know how we have to live to be great people with God and to move on with God? We have to live life knowing that there's going to be a fight and we're going to win. There's going to be a fight. No, oh, oh, hey. 15 years of fighting, one fight after another fight after another fight after another fight. There's going to be a fight, and then we're going to win. My God of mercy shall come to me. The chronically discouraged, you know what they think? They think there's not going to be a fight, and I'm going to win anyway. May I tell you, you're not winning anything without a fight. You are not going to sit there eating pig skins, watching TV, and become great. Mm -hmm. There's not going to be a fight, and I'm going to win anyway. Mm -hmm. How foolish. Yeah, there's going to be a fight, and you need to get ready for it. Yeah. Yeah. But your God of mercy will come to you. David knew better than, than to think there wasn't going to be a fight. Because from the time he was anointed to be king of, of Israel, there was nothing but a fight. He had to fight lions and bears as a shepherd, as a shepherd boy to keep his sheep and keep his flock. He had to fight an uncircumcised, uh, uncircumcised Philistine giant in order to save the kingdom. He had to fight a half-hearted, arrogant king in order to earn a position in the palace. He had to fight armies of his own kingdom to, have a, uh, to stay alive long enough to be king. He had to fight and make deals with the enemies in order to survive. And now he's sitting there at Ziglag over in the show, over in the shade with his harp playing and, and, and trying to find some assurance from God while in his ears he's hearing the brokenhearted cries of the 600 fighting warriors that have been with him for all of these years and been so faithful to God. And their cries are rattling around in his ears. And at the same time, the voice of God rattles around in there and says, Arise, yeah. King David. Yeah. There's going to be a fight. And then you're going to win. Or it might have been Psalm 34 that David took some words from. He wrote that two years before this event happened when God delivered him from the Philistine king Abimelech. That Psalm 34 that was written, uh, that was on there just a few minutes ago that we all looked at during the song. It starts, it starts out like, I will bless the Lord at all times. Whoo, all times. Good times, bad times, great times, terrible times. In the worst time of my life, God is worthy of praise. Even sitting here in the ashes at Ziglag, I'm going to praise the Lord at all times in my life. He's worthy of my praise. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. David wrote that. When praise is in your mouth, there can't be any grumbling, no complaining, no negative speech. Praise is the language of faith, right? He went on in Psalm 34 to write, My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. <laughs> Holy Ghost, magnify. You know what magnify means? It means to enlarge or to make bigger in perspective. When, when you magnify a small object, you don't change its size, right? You just change your perspective. It's not any bigger than it was. It just looks bigger. Yeah. You can't make God bigger than he is. Because how do you make omnipotence any bigger? 
But what you can do if you magnify God in your life, it's going to change your perspective of things. And I'm telling you, your perspective has everything to do with whether you are discouraged or not. How you look at things. Refuse to magnify the devil. Refuse to magnify the present negative circumstances that you're under. Don't analyze your problems with a magnifying glass. All it does is make your problems look bigger and your discouragement go deeper in life. So magnify the Lord. And he says, and let us exalt his name together. Exalt means to lift up, right? Talk about how big God is, how powerful God is, how majestic God is. When you have a bigger perspective, it makes your troubles seem smaller. I sought the Lord, 34 says, and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. Do you, see, do you, do you see how transparent David is? Here is a man who as a boy stood before a nine foot nine inch giant and didn't bat an eye and charged toward him to kill him. And he's talking about fear. What are you afraid of, David? Fear? You're, you're fearful? You fought a giant, you didn't even blink and you're full of fear. Yeah, I'm full. In your deepest, darkest times of discouragement, God will give you a song that'll bring faith and encouragement out of your life. And in this time of deep discouragement, David encouraged himself in the Lord his God because God can make a way when there is no way. Because God, listen to this, because God is always doing something more than you can see. Now let me just say that one more time. God can make a way when there is no way. Because God is always doing something beyond what we can see. Next verses, then David said to Abathar, the priest, Ahimelech's son, please bring the ephod to me. The ephod was the priestly garment. The garment of the high priest was special. It, th this one was a common ephod, but the high, speech, high, high priest ephod was special and it had a breastplate. And in the breastplate, it had two stones. It had a white stone and a black stone called the Urim and the Thummim. You probably have never even heard of them. But that was a lot of ways, uh, and a lot of times, that's how they made decisions. You've heard of being blackballed? That, that's where it came from. The blackball and the whiteball. God, is this your will? Is this your choice? And, and God would speak through the, through the breastplate and the Urim and the Thummim. But it, it, would, it came from an ephod. But this was just a little common priest ephod. This was not the high priest ephod. But it was used to speak to the Lord through. This, this, this was a, a priestly garment. And David said, bring me that ephod over here. So David inquired of the Lord, saying, here's what David asked the Lord. Shall I pursue this troop? In other words, God, do you want me? Now, now think about this. He's asking God if God wants him to chase the Amalekites. Now, I'm afraid I probably wouldn't have, have, have asked the question. I said, buddies, come on, let's saddle up. Those Amalekites are going to catch it, buddy. But David said, let's ask the Lord. And he said, Lord, do we, he said, do, do I pursue this troop? And, 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 um, and, and the Lord said, and shall I overtake them? And the Lord answered him and said, pursue for you shall surely overtake them and without fail recover all. God said, go get them and you're going to recover. Don't be afraid. You go, go after them and you're going to get everything they stole from you. Well, did they recover all? Oh, yeah, they recovered all. And even more than that, yeah, yeah. They not only recovered their wives, their children, their possessions, and, 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 and restore what was stolen from them, but, he, but, but, but the Amalekites were a roving band of bandits that went all over the kingdom robbing other little towns and other little places and all that. And they just happened to drop into Ziklag with all the men gone and took the women and kids and burned the houses down, sold all their possessions. That's the way they were. They were just marauders. 
And so David caught him with a whole bunch of bounty from everywhere else they had been. And when he killed every one of them and, and, and took their possessions and then took all the possessions that the Amalekites had stolen from everywhere else they had, divided the spoil among his men. There were 400 men with him, 200 stayed back by the creek to watch over their supplies. And, uh, and he took, he gave these 400 their spoils, spoil, spoil, and he even took spoils back to the 200 that wasn't even in the battle and said, hey, you're, you're part of our men. Here, this is yours. This is as much as these guys got. You guys are getting that. And, and, and encouraged favor with the entire kingdom. And what David didn't know was that at the same time, the very same time, that David was fighting the Amalekites, God's hand of protection and favor had moved away from Saul mm -hmm. and Saul was killed in a battle at the very same moment. Mm -hmm. Had David not encouraged himself in the Lord, had David laid down right there and just wallowed in his misery, accused God of mismanagement, blamed everybody for the mistakes and the, and the problems, blasted God for not being faithful and letting him suffer for 15 years. He was anointed 15 years ago. He would still be laying in that spot right now today. But because David encouraged himself in the Lord, he was up and, and at the battle and recovered everything that had been lost and even more. And David became king of Israel. It has a happy ending because you know David became king of Israel. Yeah. But at Ziklag, David could have easily fallen into despair and given up on God's promises. The devil came against David with everything he could muster and the devil will do all he can to discourage you too. His favorite tool is discouragement and it remains his most effective tool because he can take any situation in your life and cast discouragement on it. David had every logical reason and every opportunity to be overcome with discouragement. Mm -hmm. So do you. Yeah. But those thoughts that the devil is trying to place into your mind right now, when you go home after church and you turn on the news and you see all of the anarchy, destruction, and, and, and idiocy and everything that's going on, the devil's saying to you mm -hmm. a many a discouraging thing. Mm -hmm. It's not ever gonna be the same. You're gonna get over this. This is not gonna work. The nation's going down the tube. Discouragement after discouragement after discouragement. You have every logical reason to look at that stuff and think so, but I'm gonna tell you, that's not what God says. That's not God's words. Yeah. You're not hearing God's words. Mm -hmm. You're hearing the words of an enemy because God has not changed. No, he He's gonna say the same thing today that he said yesterday yeah, yeah. and all the days because God is always doing more than we can see. Mm -hmm. So let's bow our heads just one second. Let's...